Howdy, my name's Blaine, Blaine Eddy. Um, basically, I've been hunting these coyotes, predators in general, for damn near 30 years now. Uh, I've been told I put up one hell of a good coyote. So we're going to go through this as quick as we can, Not try not to waste a lot of time. I'll try to teach you everything I can on this so you can put out a, a real fine pelt for the market. We're going to start here with the truck itself. We like to field skin our coyotes. Uh, skin our coyotes right after you, right after you've shot them, is the best way to do it. A lot less blood, uh, no green bellies or anything like that. No rot's going to occur. You're going to get the fur off the carcass just as quick as you can. You'll just end up with a better fur if you can do it like that. I've made an attachment for the front of this '92 Toyota. It's uh, that's what we use to skin the coyotes immediately after we kill them. We come back from a stand. We peel them immediately. This is how we do it. This plate comes off here, exposes this box. Inside the box, we have our gloves, our gambrel, tail puller, tail splitter, some sharp knives, shoulder plunger. I'll show you how this be this is an important tool you have to have a shoulder plunge. This is the skin pole. The skin pole attaches here to the front of this mount. A lot of guys use a receiver hitch for the same type of mount here. It's a pretty nice way to skin these dogs. You simply take your gambrel, hook your dog <clears throat> down near the foot and tendon at the almost the base of the leg there. Go ahead and hook your gambrel up here and start peeling your dog. The swivels here so you can spin the coyote or fox, whatever you have around. Makes it easier, you can get the job done. Uh, normally I can peel a coyote uh, in about three minutes. Um, I've skinned them as quick as two and a half minutes. When you do a lot of coyotes, you'll get very proficient at this. This application right here really aids in that. Uh, I would highly suggest that instead of bringing your coyotes home, peel them in the field when they're still hot, when they're still warm. You do a lot better job. Everything's much better when you can get that fur off that carcass right away. Um, anyway, we're going to go on in here. We've got a coyote in the first shed here. We're going to go on in here and start uh, the skinning process and, and the rest of it. But I, again, I thought it was important that uh, that you're introduced to this type of field skinning method because it's the preferred method. You don't want to bring your coyotes home if you don't have to. You don't want to have blood all over everything. Skin them in the field. Come up with something like this that will allow you to skin them in the field. Okay, let's go in the first shed and peel a dog. Okay, this coyote here is a female. It's about 25 pounds. Typical dog. It was taken uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, again, uh, for the sake of the video, we're going to peel it inside here. I don't know if Ian can get a whole picture of the whole coyote right there, but you can see there's some blood on this coyote because it was put in the back of the truck. If it was skinned in the field, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be looking this rough. It would uh, be looking a lot better, but uh, when we're done, you're going to see just a tremendous amount of difference between how they look like this and when they turn out for the fur market. So, And this coyote does have some pelt damage. He was hit high in the back. Um, he's not a trapped coyote obviously and we don't want to do a video on a trapped coyote so uh, we're going to show you how to when we're fleshing in this hide we're going to show you how to work around all these wounds and stuff so you can still produce a really fine product okay basically you hook your coyote on your gambrel in between the tendon and the bone you're going to start your first cut at the base of the tail here you'll see there's a color separation in the fur. The underbelly fur, or the lighter color fur, comes up against and meets the back fur. It's kind of a darker brown here on the back, and it's a little bit, there's a little bit of a red tint on this coyote here, but basically there's a line that you can draw where the color separates. That's where you want to make your cut. Now this knife I use has about a three inch blade. It's extremely sharp. I put a lanyard on it, so when I need to pull on the coyote, I can pull on the coyote. When I need to cut the coyote, the knife's right there. I'm not fumbling around trying to find it. It really makes things faster. You want to put a lanyard on your knife. Okay, you're going to start at the base of the tail. 
Now again, be careful and come right up that, right up that color change right here. All the way up. I probably should mention, or probably should have mentioned, if you're, when you get the coyote hung like this, and you notice, if you're looking in this area here, and you notice a flea or two, uh, at that point it's a good idea to take a little raid or something and spray this part of the, uh, of the coyote and kill them fleas. I've never had any real serious problem with flea bites, but sometimes they can be an irritation. So, anyway, you peel this side up, and you're going to do the same on this side. You're going to start at the base of the tail again. You're going to come right up that color separation, just like you did on the other leg. Clear up here, right up to the top, just like that. Okay? Now at that point you just simply start pulling the fur away from the carcass. Okay? You just very carefully cut down through here. Cut up as far as you can. Come down here. Try to separate the fur from the meat. You can see where the knife came up through. Okay, now I'm generally I would be going considerably faster but we're just going to do this slow so people can you can get an idea how this is done come up on the top part of the leg start peeling down here like this you want to separate the fur from the meat just like this okay you get that about like this you're going to remove it from the this part of the foot here so you come in and you cut around this. You want to be careful, don't cut through the tendon that's holding this dog up, that's supporting this dog. See, there's your tendon. All we did is peeled around here, re re removed the fur from that part of the leg. Then it's just a matter of pulling the fur down. Get your fingers in there. And don't worry about some of the meat that ends up on the, on the skin, because that'll all come off in the, in the fleshing process. Okay, now, that's that side. It's completed. That's the first step. Now you come over to this leg, and you're going to do the same thing. So everybody can see now, if there's any um, questions about this, just back the tape up and play it forward until you get this. This is important. Be very careful when you're cutting through here that you don't cut through the fur, because every cut you make, you got to sew it up. And that just adds more time. Okay, you've done the same thing on this side. Come up here as high up this foot as you can, where your gambrel is, and just cut the fur away. Pull it down. You'll find that you'll, you'll, you use your hands, your fingers, a hell of a lot more than you'll use your knife. Um, you don't want to use your knife if you don't have to, because all a knife's going to do is just tear holes in your fur. And uh, so wherever possible, just try to use your finger strength. Pull that fur down. Okay, now, that's where you should be at this point. Now, come back to the tail. You want to remove this area here because it's not going to do anything but just rot on you. So bring your knife in carefully underneath this side and cut this stuff away. Okay, that little bit right there won't hurt a thing to be left on there. If you can get all this, that's fine. There's no fur on this right here, so there's no reason to have it on there. However, we're not going to worry about it right now. Okay, now we're going to start to split the tail. Next step. We come in here, right at the base of the tail. We're going to 
start to split the tail here. There's a fleet right there. Okay, we've just kind of split the tail down about three inches. I like to go about four inches down the tail, about like this, maybe just a tiny bit more than that, about like that. And then we're going to back up here, we're going to start peeling it, the hide, away from the tail. Come around here, get this side. Okay, now you've got it about like this. Now this is really important here. Be very careful when you start to skin around this tail. You don't want to cut through the tail, through the fur. You don't want to cut through the end of the tendons on this tail either. Then you won't be able to peel the entire tail off. It's important. And you'll see why in just a minute. Slowly skin that tail down to just about where you had it split. Okay, that's just about where I had it split. Now at that point Get your tail puller. Okay, a lot of guys just use their hand strength. Um, I used to use my hand strength, but I'm getting old now and I don't have the strength in my hand, so I use a tail puller. It's got slits in it, or holes in it. Slide that over the tail like this. Clamp it down shut. It's right around the top of that tail. Okay, you take the take the tail and grab it like this. And pull pull like that and it just simply pulls the, the tailbone right off. You can take it like this and use it in this manner. I like to get a hold of the tail with one hand and the splitter with the other hand so I don't have any problems with the tail possibly you know, getting pulled off. Now you've got the tail pulled off, tendons out of it. Now you've got to split the rest of the tail. We only split the tail down four inches. The rest of the tail has to be split or it will rot. You cannot leave this undone. You must split the rest of the tail. Okay, they make a handy little device for that. Tail splitter. You start that in right there. Let's see if I can get this clear up for you. Start right in there where it was where it was split and you simply pull this down towards the tip. Nice and easy. There's going to be a little bit of fur left on your splitter. Doesn't make doesn't matter. See it split that tail all the way to the very end. Clear to the end. The whole tail is split now. Quick and dirty. Easy. Okay. Now you've got that part done. You can pull down a little bit more around the back side of the coyote. And this is where you're at at that. Try to pull this much of this fur away from there as you can. Okay. Now, there's really no need to keep this part of the pelt. Um, I. I think that it's best at that point to just about in the middle of the crotch area here just make a cut directly across and take that part of the fur down. Now, now see you're going to end up with some of this meat like this on here but don't worry about it because that will come off with the fleshing process. Sure it would be great if you could peel this dog without any of this meat on here but it, it really doesn't matter. It's more important to get the, the pelt off without cutting any holes in it and cutting the legs properly and that sort of thing. Okay, now at this stage, you simply start pulling this dog down. Now, if this dog would have just been killed, let's say this dog was only about 10 to 15 minutes dead, this this hide would come off of here like you can't believe it would just come really fast. Anyway, now we've gotten to where you can see some of the damage from the shot that went high on this coyote. through here and pull him down. Just keep pulling him down. Keep pulling him down. Use your fingers. Don't use that knife if you don't have to. You've got the knife right here, but if you don't have to use it, don't use it. Pull it down here. You get about right to here. This is much easier on the doing this on the truck, but I like to get the coyote and pull this this direction. Just put your weight into it. Pull it back as far as you can. 
that hide will come forward. Okay, take your thumb on this part of the coyote, push your thumb in here, your thumb in here, try to expose the inside of those legs. Okay, this is where you're at. This is where the shoulder plunger comes into it. Take your shoulder plunger very carefully, very carefully. Come in here in between the leg and the fur and come around here and poke the plunger through between the fur and the leg. If you poke through the fur at this point and you pull on it, you will tear your fur up bad. Okay, now we're going to pull on this and expose that, that leg. Okay, that's probably far enough. I found it's best to put a little moisture on your plunger. Now on this leg, we're going to come in here, just above the fur, and, and inside here, you can see where we've come in just above the fur. We're not punching through the fur. We're going between the leg and the fur. Same thing. Once you pull it through, plunge it through, pull. Okay? Pull it down below the base of the, the joint here. Oh, an inch or so. Usually there's a little bit of cutting work here, but not much. Again, we're gonna we're taking our time with this coyote so you guys can hopefully won't have any questions at all on this. Okay? Finish pulling the fur down onto the leg, a few more inches. About right there. When you get it about like that, you'll notice the bone right here, probably two and a half, three inches below that. And you want to cut around the fur so you can get it off the foot, the front foot here. Okay, just cut around, pull the leg out. Same on this one. Okay, now. You're almost done with this project. Okay, pull down here as much as you can. Let's try pulling it this way again. Okay, just slowly pull on that. Again, if this coyote was hot, this coyote was just killed, you can this step would be much faster. You'll be able to pull it right over right to the ears. We're going to go ahead and be careful and we're going to cut around here. Cut around here and then grab the hide again. Usually at the tail like this, something in this regard. Pull it. See how that gave, that fur gave way. Now you've exposed the ears and the jaw here. Okay, take your knife. These ear butts right here are exposed. At the far end base of the earbuds, make a cut. Okay, you've just cut through the base of the earbud perfectly. Okay, go over to this ear, same thing, make a cut. You've just cut through the earbuds. Don't, if you don't have to cut down into the meat like I just did, uh, don't. Just cut where you need to because it'll just dull your knife. Okay, I usually at that point put a thumb or a finger in here. And just start peeling around very carefully. Very carefully. You can see that this knife is very sharp. It's doing a good job. As long as I'm careful with it. Okay, now I'm getting to where I'm going to expose the eyes. They're going to be real coming up real quick here. Okay, there's an eye right there. You just cut very slowly. You get to where you can see that eye, you cut very slowly. Put your finger in there like this and cut very slowly, careful. Go to the other side. Staying right close to the skull. Cut very slowly. And that eye will expose itself. Just cut very slowly. This is an important part if you're going to be doing taxidermy. You don't want to cut away any of these eyelids or anything like that because it's important taxidermist said they hate that so be careful you're right in here 
Okay, now you're going to cut away from the jaw right here. So take your knife, just come in here like this, and expose the upper and lower lip. And just start cutting away, keeping very carefully, keep your knife right next to the skull. Same on this end. You've exposed the upper and lower lip. You're going to cut very carefully. Just kind of just start pulling it down. As you pull, it comes away easier. Okay, around here, cut down. In the back here, underneath the lower lip. Cut around here and pull it down. Okay, you're getting up near the nose. Just keep peeling around here. Peeling around here until you finally get the nose off. Okay. Now, if, when you're selling fur for the market, I don't worry about skinning this low, lower lip all the way out. I usually get it to that point and cut it off like that. And that's that. Now you've got a, a properly skinned coyote pelt. You can see the damage. Hopefully, when we're done here with this. You won't be able to see this damage on this finished pelt. Ideally, you want a coyote that doesn't have a big old hole in it like that. But you can see when you're done, there's no, there's no cuts of the knife from the knife anywhere else. Anywhere. Other than where it was supposed to. Okay. Now we'll turn this pelt first side out. Where a lot of guys would, at this point, would flesh the coyote. I recommend that uh, we put the coyote in the wash tub and give it a complete rinsing. So we're going to go ahead and put this in the tub and we're going to rinse it out here, wash it and rinse it out for uh, oh, about 10 minutes, 5 or 10 minutes and, uh, and we'll come back to it, the fleshing process. It's, this step is important. Don't flush your dogs after you get done peeling them. Rinse them out like this. Believe me, there's a difference. It makes a difference. Okay, uh, on the carcass, you simply cut the tendons away. Like so, it'll fall and then go ahead and get rid of your carcass. That's another reason you don't want to be doing it, bringing them back, because now we got to find some place to get rid of the carcass. Okay, let's go ahead and get the bottom of the tub here. Okay, this is just an old ringer washer I picked up for 50 bucks in the yard cell. Does the best job of anything I've ever seen. Just putting these piles up, getting the, getting the pellets clean. Agitates really well. You see down in here, Ian, see how much blood's coming out of this pelt? This is just ice cold rinse water. No soap in here or nothing. All we're doing is we're just running this pile through this thing to get most of the blood and the dirt off. If you wash them one time only with soap, it's a lot harder to get them clean. You need to do this rinse cycle. Not only to get the majority of the dirt and the blood out of the coyote, but it also primes the coyote so it'll be fleshed properly. It'll flesh easier, better. Okay, we'll go ahead and turn this and let this drain. And that's that process. Okay, this coyote's been in here rinsing for 5-10 minutes. We're going to take him, we're going to hang him on this hook I've made above this tub. Drip dry, not drip dry, but he's going to drip most of the water out of him. Okay, he'll sit like this. Well, probably about 20 minutes. Okay, so we're going to shut the tape off. We're going to come back in here in 20 minutes. And, uh... So most of the water is dripped out of this pile. He's still going to be very damp, um, not even remotely um, dry. And then after that, after we get him dripped out quite a bit, then we're going to start to flesh him. So 
When we come back in, the next process is going to be flushing the coyote. The mo probably the most important part of the whole process is the flushing of the coyote. Okay, the dog's been hanging here a few minutes. We're going to go ahead and pull as much of the moisture as we can out of this pelt. This isn't all that important. You just want to get quite a bit of the moisture out so it doesn't end up making a big watery mess on the floor. Squeeze it down, clear down the base of the tail. Okay. Now, let me get rid of these gloves here. Take the dog off. And turn him skin out. Boy, that hole's ugly on that pelt, but we're gonna we're gonna get her fixed up, so you won't even know it was there. Again, if you can hunt with a cartridge, preferably 17 or even smaller, 14, something that's not gonna cause any damage, use the cartridge. It's not gonna cause the damage because when you put up hundreds and hundreds of coyotes like I have, you get damn tired of sewing holes. <clears throat> you can put up five coyotes in the same amount of time it would take you to do one of these that's damaged. When they have damage everything the process is slowed down. Okay. He's in fur in. This is a six inch flushing beam. It's hardwood. It's very smooth. It's an excellent beam. When you go out and buy a beam don't skimp on the quality on these beams. Don't buy something that isn't anything less than grade A. Uh, it makes a difference. Okay, it's hard, it's smooth, it's about six inches. It kind of has a rounded shape to it on one side. That's to match the shape of the draw knife. Okay, this is how I use it. Some guys use their, their uh, fleshing beams in a different way. Some guys mount them on, on uh, chairs and reach out and draw them forward. Uh, some guys use their uh, flushing beams in this manner, where they're pushing straight down to get the fat off. Okay, you take your pelt, <clears throat> slide it on your beam. With the rounded portion of the beam facing you, you're going to bring it down. And this is the way I do it, just to the base of the nose. And go ahead and hook it up, push it up. However you decide to make how your beam's going to mount, that's totally up to you. I just have a big beam here in the room with a 16 penny nail. It's wedged at a certain angle. I've notched my beam at the top so it fits up, in, up into the nail. You see the nail right here. The hide just simply goes over and then it pinches itself up against between the beam and the top of the 16 penny duplex nail. Okay, now you're ready to start fleshing this dog. Now, <clears throat> inside this box here we have some really fine sawdust. This is important. The sawdust enables the draw knife to really bite on the fur. It takes the tallow, the meat, the fat, everything makes a much more efficient process. Okay, so you take your sawdust, place it on the skin, just be liberal with it, just dump it on there. Okay, you take your draw knife. This is just a typical draw knife. It's not it's nothing fancy. I think I paid 15 bucks for it. That you can get some really expensive ones that uh, but I haven't found that there's all that big a difference. The edge here, as you can see, I'm rubbing my thumb against here. It's not sharp at all. It's dull, very dull right here. You're scraping the fat and the meat off. You're not cutting it off, you're scraping it off. Okay? Take the draw knife and use it in this manner. With this bevel right here facing towards you. Okay? You're going to start drawing down at the base base of the nose, right in, in between the eyes here, you're going to start drawing the knife down like this, in this manner. You want to peel as much of that meat off there as you can. Okay, 
that's not too bad. So you can see there's still some meat and stuff left up in here, but we'll get to that. We'll get to that in just a minute. <clears throat> get yourself a real sharp razor blade. I use these Eternas, they're from Germany, they're extremely sharp, I can get them pretty cheap. Okay, you're gonna, you're gonna remove the rest of the air butt. This stuff has all gotta come off. Okay, and I hope, I hope we're gonna be able to get this all on film. You start right here, where the skin comes around. You, get, you can see how that's starting to expose that ear butt. And you're gonna remove all this excess meat here, all the way around this ear. You don't have to get every last bit of it, but you gotta get most of it. If you don't do this right here, this meat and this fat right here that's been left on this hide will rot and the pelt will slip. The hair will fall out. I guarantee you. This is very important. Don't bypass. Look at all that fat and meat we've taken off that pelt. Okay? Do the same on the other side. This is very important. We need to get all this, if not all, most of this stuff off of here. Okay. Now, part done there. Now, what you're going to do, you're going to go back to your sawdust, <clears throat> take some sawdust, and put it directly right on the ear in this manner. On the other ear, too. Just engulf the ear. Okay, then you're going to find where the fur itself, or the hide, separates from the ear butt, and you're going to start peeling that down. And that sawdust helps bite, helps give you that bite down in there. So what you're doing is you're turning the ear. You're just turning the ear, exposing the inside of the ear. You want to be careful and peel that back. So you're almost to the tip of the ear. Now if you poke your finger through it like we've done here, don't worry about it, no problem. Okay, go to this ear, do the same thing. Okay, you're going to peel that ear, just peeling them ears inside out. This is important. If you don't do this, there's a good chance the ear can rot on the inside. You want to expose all this. Allow it to dry, or semi-dry, I should say. Okay, now you've got the ears all turned in. You got all the fat off, most of the meat off. Everything looks good. When you get to that point, you're done as far as the ears concerned. Take your razor blade. Now you've got to peel the lips, <clears throat> the nose, nose butt off. Uh, let's get a, let's get a nail right here. secure this a little better. I usually just attach it in this manner so it doesn't come off of my beam. You can do this part when the pelt is on the stretcher board if you want but I just get it out of the way right here now. Okay, you're going to cut most of the nose butt right off, right off the bat. Okay, then <clears throat> with a sharp razor blade start cutting down the the lips. All this stuff has to come off, okay? I want to cut right down the edge of the lip, like so, and then start peeling this stuff off. Hopefully we're getting this clear enough on the video. Don't worry if you'd nick it a tiny place here or there. Try not to if you can help it, but you can see the whiskers will start exposing themselves. It makes it a little bit difficult. You just keep peeling down here. This is part that most guys don't do on their pelts. And I, I think it's a mistake. I think it should be done. It allows that face to dry 
the, the chance of any kind of slippage or rotting is really greatly minimized. Okay, you're going to hold the held around here and try to get as far around here as you can with it around that lip okay that's about as good as it needs to be you can see there's still a little meat left on here but it's not there's not much and around the eyes there's a lot of fat around the eyes that's got to come off Okay, that's good enough right there. And you go to this side. Cut down the edge of the lip as close as you can to the edge without cutting into the fur. And then start taking the meat off. This is a kind of a difficult part to learn. But once you've done a few of them and if you can go back and forth on the video, you'll see how careful I'm being not to cut through the pelt. Again, if you cut through the pelt, you're going to have to sew it up. I hope I don't cut through the dang pelt while we're doing this, but I, I might. I've done it plenty of times before. Okay, so stay right, right close to that lip and get as much of that lip as you can. You're, we're not going to leave the rest of this lip on here, but we're just going to get it at a different time. Okay. That's not too bad right there. There's a little bit of meat left on there, but that's as, about as much as I want to do on that face right there. The eyes are very important. There's a lot of fat around the eyes. Get as much of that off of there as you can. Okay. Now, if there was a difficult part as far as flushing a coyote, it's coming up. Okay, take your dog, we'll pull him up on your beam, where he's around the ears, like this. Put him back on your custom deal here. Add some more sawdust. Okay, now this is this requires a little bit of effort, but it's not that bad. Put a pretty good amount of effort into this draw knife, pushing forward, and start drawing down on the pelt. You can see the, the meat and the fat, everything's coming off. Under here, you can it exposes a nice white hide. Now, I'm putting a pretty good amount of pressure into this, but if I were to put too much pressure into this, or if there were to be a burr on the fur, a knife would cut right through the hide. Okay, apply some more sawdust and just keep working it. You, as you get experienced, you'll be able to come across at an angle like that. I would recommend for the beginners just to come straight down with it. And only apply as much pressure as is needed to do the job. Any more than that, you're going to tear right through the hide. When you get around here, the hide gets thin underneath these legs and the corner legs be very careful when you get around to this point use more sawdust in these areas it helps pull that meat right off now we've gotten to some damage here which I really hate to see and uh, I mean I'm glad we got the dog but I would have been a lot happier if we wouldn't have any damage at all on this coyote okay we're down here this is going to be important right here Pull the dog up, re-hook him on a higher point on your beam. Dust him up again. Very carefully, very carefully start working down around this wound. Okay, you can see that grease. See the grease coming off of this dog. That's important that that comes off of there. If you don't get that grease off from around that tear, that grease will come back through the wound and it'll get on the fur and it'll leave a greasy spot right there. And the, the buyers will pick that up right now. It's easy for them to see. Okay, carefully. Come down through. Try to get your draw knife right close to the edge of the tear as much as you can. Be careful. 
you get to a spot like I just did, where it's wanting to take the fur with it, just go to your razor blade. Be careful. Poke the fur back in. Be as careful as you can. Now you can see that if we didn't have this damage here, we'd be ripping down through this coyote at a pretty good pace and we'd more than likely be done already with the flushing. Okay, but you got to be careful with this flushing part here, especially when you got damage like that. You can see that I'm pushing hard enough and all this stuff's coming off. Now if you were to leave any of this stuff on this hide, this thing would rot and the fur is going to fall out. Trust me, this has to be done. You can see how this, this hide is exposed now to the nice white hide itself. The leather, if you would, is now exposed. We've cleaned around that wound extremely well. We don't have any fat or meat or any large amount of grease there that's obvious. And we go ahead and keep working our way down this pelt. This area down here is notorious for slipping. You can see the fat the fat that's on this dog right here. Not a lot, but if you didn't try to get as much of that off as you could, the pelt's going to rot and it's going to slip on you. I'll come down through here and try to get as much of this stuff as you can. But be careful. Try to use the old sawdust. to the very last bit. That meat that was left on that coyote when we first started skinning him, that's getting pulled off right now. That's why we don't worry about it. Some of these spots that may get a little bit difficult down towards the bottom. Just take your razor blade. Don't worry too much about it if you cut a little bit. This is down in that rectal area. And a lot of this stuff doesn't have fur on the other side of it anyway. So just kind of get all that fat off. Your tail's been split. She's flushed all the way down. You got any little spots of fat knocked off of there? Okay. Get this right here a little bit there. Okay, now take your dog and Turn him around, you can get the underside, the belly side of him. That has to be flushed too. Make sure that you still have the rounded part of the fleshing being facing you, otherwise you'll do terrible damage. Okay, pull the dog up, hook the lower lip over the top of your beam, at least that's the way I do it. Put it back on your Pinched up against your beam, add more sawdust, go ahead and start flashing again. You can see this stuff coming off. That sawdust does a beautiful job. Pulls that meat and the fat and the towel and all that protein and stuff right off. Pulls the moisture out. Careful underneath the arms. Very careful underneath these arms. Don't apply near as much pressure here. This is a thin area right here. You can see it. How thin that is right there. You want to be very careful. See, you got meat underneath here. It's got to come off. You got to be careful. 
don't put near as much pressure on that hide right there as you would on the in the middle of the back. Okay, now some of the stuff that's like this, that's leather. That's going to leather right up. This isn't fat or it isn't meat. It's just part of the skin. You don't need to you don't need to take all that stuff off. This is the belly area. And on females with tits, I want to be careful coming down through here. If you hook one of these tits, like right here, I'm glad that happened. I just took the tit and it just pulled a hole right open in this dog. <laughs> anyway, that's what can happen, and it happens to the best of them. Pull the dog up on there a little bit more. And go back to flushing very carefully. One hole's enough in this dang thing. Push around that, that tit right there. Try to get most of this stuff off very carefully. This is very thin right here. And this stuff has got to come off. Okay, down it towards the end here. That little more sawdust in there. Carefully keep going. Big blob of meat right there that was left on. It's gone. Kind of go around the hide. Any place that looks like there's any fat or any meat left on the pelt, flush it off of there. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm rambling on on this tape, but I'm trying to be as, as detailed as I can here. And you get, get down here, take any of this fat. You may have trouble with the draw knife pulling off. Even if you take just a little bit of fur with it, it's more important to get that fat off of there. Okay. Now there's a finished, completed flesh pelt. Unfortunately, I knocked a hole in it right here, but I've done that many times, folks. Okay, now, your tail split all the way out, your ear butts are cut out, your face is flashed, your nose butt's cut out, your lips are about 90% fit completed, your ear butts are, everything's exposed. This is how you're, they're supposed to look when they're completely flashed. Okay, take the dog, fur back out. Turn the ears back out so you expose the fur again. The next step is going to be we're going to put the final wash on this coyote. We've rinsed most of the blood out, now we're going to wash it. Now we're going to make this fur clean. Pull his legs out. Make sure all the fur is exposed. Put him in your wash tub. Okay, this coyote can wash. We need some on up here. Down in here, still got the sediment here. I want to mention that you want to use a mild detergent on these tiles. This tile's going to wash it for about 15 minutes. Uh, mild detergent or baby shampoo is what you want to use. Again, most of the blood and the dirt and everything came out when you did the initial rinse. One of the reasons that initial rinse, rinse is so very important. Because you'd have to wash these dogs three or four times to get them as clean as we're going to do it if you don't do that initial rinse. That initial rinse is very important. Let's say enough about it. Okay, now I probably ought to mention it. If you haven't skin these dogs right away, and you're using a wash tub like this, if you've neglected the pelt and any kind of gangrene or rotting starts to occur, you're going to see hair in the bottom of these, in the bottom of this wash tub. A lot of hair. You can see we don't have any hair at all in here. This pelt has not even begun to rot. We, we skinned it within 24 hours. 
It was very cold when we shot it. Again, uh, it's it's always better to skin them immediately right after you kill them. But, but for heaven's sakes, don't let them go no more than 24 hours. There's no indication at all that there's any slip fur in here. We've got a good tell. So, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to cycle the water through. We'll fill this tub back up. It's kind of a tedious uh, part of the whole deal, but we're going to, it's important that I show you how you cycle the water through to get an absolutely clean pelt. Look down in here, you can see how clean this water is. There's still some suds in there. We're going to go ahead and let that fill up. Let's get in there. Go ahead and plug it back in. This is what I call the rinse cycle. You just cycle the water through. As soon as this water builds up pretty good, I'm going to go ahead and turn the drain. So the, the same amount of water that's coming in the tub is going out. So it's a cycling process. And you can see now there's a change in the color of the water. And the pile still has a little bit of dirt in it. A little bit of blood residue. It's going up in the water. Okay, we're going to turn our drain. And now we have just as much water going out as there is water coming in. We're going to let this cycle like this for about five minutes. In five minutes time, most of the time, you'll notice that water it's going to be crystal clear, almost crystal clear. When you get it to that point, the pelt is clean. Okay, this dog's been cycling through for about five, six minutes. You can see by the look of the water, it's a lot cleaner. I'm going to go ahead and shut the water off, open the drain. I'm going to hang this coyote back up. Let him drip dry a little bit. Not dry, just, just like before. When we initially rinsed him, he's a lot lighter now. He doesn't weigh near as much. We probably took about four or five pounds of fat and meat off this dog. And this is one that's... Uh, didn't have a whole lot on him. Some coyotes will have as much as 10 pounds of fat and meat. Okay, we're going to go ahead and let him drip dry this time. Let's go ahead and try to pull that water out of this dog. the water's pulled out of this coyote. Um, most of the time I'll let him drip dry for oh 20 minutes to a half hour. It just makes the initial drying process quicker when most of the water is, is out of the pelt. But they're perfectly fine at this stage. Just go ahead and put on the stretcher. That's what we're going to do next. I make my own stretchers. They're made out of one by six pine or one by four pint, excuse me, six feet long. I feather them at the edges 
you don't have to do that, but I feather them here at the edges because it just makes the first go down onto the stretcher longer. It makes the coyotes appear to be longer. I stretch my coyotes longer than most folks. Um, I don't stretch them wide. Um, I like to show how prime the coyote is by stretching it long and not sucking it, pulling it so wide that it that it stretches the hair apart and makes it look thin. Anyway, this is just, uh, you can see how this thing's been cut at the top. Got a piece of leather on top here. We build these things and sell these things in there. But they're really easy to, to make for yourself. I recommend these a lot more than the wire stretchers. Uh, the wood just seems to, to work best on coyotes, fox, bobcat, what have you. Um, down here they're designed to expand open out to about 14, 15 inches down here. Use a big plastic wing nut on there. It makes it real easy to stretch this and tighten it down so it won't move. It works real good. Okay, take your pelt. Let's see, let's put it over here. Take your pelt. Turn him skin out. Okay, hook his nose or his eye on something temporarily. Remember the ears that were turned, turn them back out again. As far as you can, expose that ear. Just like that. The legs, pull them out, expose them. You can see that's a hell of an eyesore right there where that wound is. Again, that's why you you don't want to hit hit these coyotes too hard, too high or too far back, and you sure as hell don't want to be shooting them with with too much gun. Um, this is really an annoyance to have to take the time to sew these up. Uh, you can put up a hell of a lot more coyotes in the same time if you um, if you don't have damage. Okay, now take your pelt. I usually put the back side or the tail end towards the adjustment plate there at the bottom. Let's see, I'm hung up here. Okay, pull it down on you. Be careful when you're putting these pelts down on these stretchers. Make sure your stretchers are made very, the wood very smooth, no snags, anything that's going to grab and bite that fur and pull it out. That's not good. and just slowly work that pelt down onto your stretcher. Get it centered on the stretcher as much as you possibly can. Pull it slip over the top and it'll stay put. Pull down on the pelt as much as you can. You want to get that length out of that pelt. Okay, try to get the thing positioned on there as best you can, straight as you can, turn it around, check, make sure the belly's on there fairly straight, and the legs are straight. Okay, then take your push pins. I use just a little handle hammer, these little push pins. The ones with the longer pins on them. Don't overdo the downward pulling on these. The more, the wider you stretch these coyotes, and the longer you stretch them. Length is pretty good, but don't overdo it because the the more you stretch the skin, the less prime the pelt looks. There's a natural way that these coyotes look. You want to make them look as natural as you can. Okay, so just. You know, don't overdo that uh, that aspect of it. Put your pins down here on the legs, like so. Your other leg. 
Right in the corner, pull it down. Try to make them as even as you can. Let's see that that didn't quite get up good. There we go. Still didn't get up, did it? Okay, we'll go back to that in just a second. Okay, at that point try to pull the belly around and get that belly for as much of that on the back side of that as you can. And turn your pelt around. Now, if we didn't have this eyesore right here to worry about, we would move on to the next step. So we're going to have to address this. So this is the time now, before you go stretching this stretcher out, now is the time to sew this hole. So, I'm going to set this thing up, like so. I use a surgeon's needle. It's an angled needle. You can get them from Van Dyke's. This doesn't have the rounded point. This has the triangle type points. It's sharp. It'll, it'll poke through that hide real easy. If your hands are a little damp, go ahead and use some of your sawdust to dry your hands up. Okay, now, this is going to be kind of hard to show, but you want to take the fur and brush it in the direction that it looks most natural that it wants to, to, to sit at or stay at. Let's see if we can get this. You just simply can't tear into sewing these things up any old way um, just another reason just one more reason not to use too much gun and to place your shots on these animals I, I hate sewing coyote pelts gosh I hate it but it, you know it's a necessary evil you're not going to get away from it completely because no matter how hard you try sooner or later you're going to have a damaged coyote expose all the edge of the what I'm doing here is I'm trying to expose the edge of the skin so when I sew it I'm sewing right at the very edge of the skin okay and you can see there's some flags on here that you're gonna have to address this is not gonna be an easy one and we're gonna this is an important part though because it sooner or later you're gonna have damage regardless of what kind of gun you use it's gonna happen eventually okay now what I try to do is start with the worst tears first and it's personal preference you don't have to do that okay and this is the way this tore out like this so we're gonna sew it back up like that take your needle and barely hook the edge of the pelt barely Go ahead and tie a knot in it. I usually just do it granny knot, whatever the heck you call it. Right there like that. Take your razor blade. Let me get me another blade here. Cut the excess. This is dental floss we're using. You can use monofilament. I like dental floss. Okay, and then just come through here. about a quarter of an inch bites each time trying to hit just the barely edge okay now I think you've kinda of got the idea here so we're gonna go ahead and instead of watching me sew this whole coyote tear we're gonna turn the camera off and then we're going to show this thing completed but you get the idea here you can see how we're just following the natural way this thing was tore quarter inch bites right on the very edge of the fur keep knocking that fur out of your way so you can get a good sew job on it don't don't tug on this real hard either just let it naturally go back naturally conform it doesn't have to be sewed super tight okay 
Okay guys, we just finished sewing up this coyote. I don't know if I mentioned to you, but man, I hate sewing holes in coyotes. Anyway, you can see the angles and everything, and multiple times where I started and stopped. Took me about 20 minutes. That's how you want them look to be looking when you're done with them there. Okay, now we'll go ahead and stretch the pelt. I'm kind of dragging this tape on, so I'm going to try to free the pace up here a little bit. Again, get it on your board as even as you can. Get your tail kind of straight and straightened out. And turn it to the side. Go ahead and stretch her out. You want to stretch it out to the point where the belly just starts to pull them tight. And then lock her down. Turn it back around. Try to get that skin exposed on that tail so that it can dry properly. Now that tail stripper stripped that tail all the way down. Pull that down quite a ways and go ahead and pin it. Easily take a brush at this point brush the fur now you can see how even the fur ended up here and that was because we started the cut initial cut this is where the initial cut began and this fur looks uniform right here the same amount of light and dark fur see here because we we took the time to start that out right that's important it just makes the pelt look just that much better I usually pin the dog right here pulling slightly down on the pelt. This is something you don't have to do, but I I like to do it because I think it produces a little better looking pelt here towards the end. Pull the fur down, try to get it to where it, the nails line up so it looks even, symmetric. Again, we're taking our time with this as much as I can. We got to get this done. Okay, now you've got your stretched coyote. He's skin out. He's stretched. He's barely, his belly is fairly tight. All your holes are sewn. One last thing you do before you try to start to dry this pelt. See this part of the lip here that we didn't complete? When we started fleshing, we're going to go ahead, we're going to peel the rest of this off. Okay, this is not needed on here. Just be very careful and try to peel just to the edge of the lip. Like that. Any of this meat that's on here, I'm going to get rid of it right here if you see any fat or anything like that that may have been missed in the fleshing process now's the time to go ahead and cut that off okay that's pretty good right there everything looks good you've got most of the fat off um, everything pretty much everything that's left on here is going to leather up uh, you've got these little bits of skin and stuff exposed here, poking up here. This is all leather. It all leathers up. You can tell the fat from the leather. You can overdo this aspect of it too. You don't need to get every little bit of stuff off here. In fact, I'd probably go overboard on some of that. Okay, now, at this point, you take the dog, and this way I do it. Put the coyote, skin out, Put your fan, any old fan, right in front of that dog. Usually I'll do six or eight coyotes at one time. So when I put the fan on there, I don't have a lot of wasted air. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and we put the fan on this coyote with his nose down. We're going to let him finish with the water running out of him before we turn him fur out. There's a point 
it's critical where the hide has to dry so much before you can turn it out. If you wait too long, uh, you won't be able to turn the hide. If you, if, you, if you don't wait long enough, there's too much moisture left in the hide and you can still get a slippage or a rotting occur. It's rare at this point, but it can still happen. So anyway, we'll go ahead and shut the film off, come back in about three, four hours, uh, checking it from time to time. But usually about three to four hours after you put the fan on it, you can go ahead and turn the pelt. Okay. Okay, uh, got our pelt here in front of these fans. We added a fan here to speed up the process. And it's been about two hours. You see the hide sounds like it's dry. The hide itself is dang near dry but the fur underneath is still quite damp. There's a couple of spots underneath the legs here that are still just slightly, slightly damp. But overall, you can hear by, by the sound of this, with my hand down across here, that this hide's getting pretty dry. It's time to turn. Okay, the ears are dry. Again, the, uh, the fur underneath is still wet, so I'm able to, to manipulate these ears and move around. But the hide or the skin itself is about 80% dry, mostly dry. And you can see where these sole marks are. Everything is kind of contracted. It's done a nice job. It looks really good. It's ready to be turned. Let's go ahead and take, take our push pins out of the dog. Okay, now, being very careful here, grab the pelt, like, like so, and just kind of slowly pull it up. Don't let your tail get hung up on there. It looks like it's doing just that. Let's loosen that a little bit. Let the tail come back out. Okay, pull this up. Take the pelt, like so. Very carefully, start to roll it back or pull the hide inside out again or outside in, however. Anyway, here, if the hide's trying to dry, but the fur's still wet, so it allows the felt. To be manipulated. Pull it out to this point here. Go ahead and hook him, hook his nose or on something like that, so you can get get those ears pushed back out. If you let these ears dry too much, you'll have a hell of a time getting that fur back out. Now we went to the trouble of turning these ears because we wanted the inside of the ears to dry, which will keep them from rotting, and that's what we've accomplished. The fur is still wet, but the skin side is almost dry. Okay, then I like to go to the legs and pull them out, make sure they're exposed. But now we are going to dry the fur. Okay, back on the stretcher, Put the tail facing the adjustment bracket down below, just like it was before. Carefully slide the pelt back down on, turn it around here so you can get it centered. You can see that the wettest part is up here around the nose, but it will dry. It just takes a little longer. Pull the pelt down so it's centered best you can. And then back down here, and I like to take my brush and brush this portion of the pelt of the leg here before I repin it. You can kind of pull down on the pelt and repin the legs again. Just 
kind of give it a little tug down, taking the wrinkles and anything else like that out of the pellet. Looks like you've got it fairly centered on there. Go ahead and restretch. Pull it out again until you just until it just feels like the belly's starting to pull tight again, and everything is lined up. And it's on the stretcher even. And go ahead and tighten down your clamp. Don't overstretch these pelts. If you overstretch this pelt, or if you stretch it to the point where this is like beating on a drum, as this pelt dries, it could the skin could actually crack from the contraction as it dries. So don't don't pull it down too far that way, and don't try to stretch it overly wide. Okay, now it appears like the pelt's on there fairly straight. That's important because you want to show a good, properly put on pelt here. Okay. Go ahead and pin the tail the same manner that it was before. Most of the time, if the coyote's a little larger in size, the tail will reach down to the bracket and it can be pinned to the bracket so it doesn't have to be pinned off on an angle. And at that point, you can, see, you can see that the fur is still damp. I start brushing the pelt. Looks like we've got a little hole we must have missed. I don't know how, but we did right here. And now, if there ever was a time to fix anything like that, it would probably be right now. So what we're going to do is go ahead and, I don't know how we missed that, but we did. But we're going to fix it right now. Loosen that stretcher back up. When you run onto things like this, you just have to take the time to fix them. Somehow we overlook this. Okay, I'm just gonna, this hair's still really wet. The hide's still really damp up in this area. I'm gonna go ahead and sew this. It's always a better idea to sew from the skin out. But I think it will be just fine. As this pelt dries, the fur will begin to fluff up and will cover any kind of indication that there was any sewing that took place there. In fact, you can see already that this little tear here somehow that we've missed is is going to be it's going to be hid okay literally disappears So, okay, now we'll go back to what we started doing. Okay, brushing this for Okay, you're brushing this, and you're going to feel for any burrs, any little sticks that may not have got washed out. Knots, anything like that. Let's go ahead and stretch it back out like it was before. Okay. I'll go ahead and brush this thing. This is just a a fine tooth brush. You can buy them at any 
fur trapping outlet, anything like that. Um, probably even at a vet store it would have something like this. Any kind of a dog brush with a fine teeth on it to brush this fur down. So check and make sure that you've got your pelt centered onto your stretching board. Any hairs that like this particular hair here that's poking up that don't look normal. You can see from looking at the back, there's no indication of damage here because I, I took a, you know whatever time was necessary just to sew that damage up. So it's going to be difficult to see it. You still might be able to see it, but at least we did a, you know, made an attempt to try to do the best we could. Okay, and then you get the back done, turn it around, brush out the front, or the back of the tie off. Well, it looks like he's fairly well centered onto the board. Okay, now he's been brushed. Now at this stage, take the coyote, turn it upside down again. Put him back on the fan. Now this time, you don't have to pin the outside edge this time. The hide is dry enough now that it should hold its position right there like that. Go ahead and turn your fans back on. The more air that hits these coyotes, the better. Uh, normally this coyote will sit overnight with the fans on him, just like this. And then we'll come in tomorrow morning and uh, go to the next step. But we are almost completed with this coyote right now. So. If you've done everything just like was on the video and you turn up with something like this, you're, you're well on your way to being done. And we'll pick it up from here tomorrow. Okay, this coyote has been on the fans overnight. I've brushed him out one time and now we're going to do the final step. This is what I call airbrushing. Um, it's going to expose any knots, any hair that might be stuck together. Uh, it's going to bring out the fullness of the hide uh, of the fur as much as it can possibly be brought out. Um, I do this with the means of an air compressor, use of an air compressor and an air nozzle. About 60 pounds I think is in the tank right now. And uh, you simply go down through the pelt and the air compressor, the air nozzle will expose any knotting, matting, things of that nature. Um, and just simply makes the hide look that much better. So we're going to go ahead and do this real quick. Okay, as soon as you've gone down across the fur in that manner, if you take your air nozzle, 
You're going to go against the grain, you're going to lay the fur back forward. Okay, now you're going to repeat this on the underside of the pelt. Same thing as on the back. Okay, and that's basically it. I know it seems like quite a process, but that's how I put my fur up. That's the coyote that was such an ugly coyote on that gambrel when we first started. And you can see just how beautiful that pelt is right now. That is a beautiful coyote. I would guesstimate uh, at today's market value, he's going to be between $35 and $40, maybe as high as $42 coyote. And uh, there's no indication of any rubbing occurring at all. Even though this coyote was taken late in the year, there's no rubbing. It's a very prime coyote. He has a good belly on him. Um, when coyotes have heavier, wider bellies on them, color-wise, white, they're worth more. Um, obviously, coyotes that are taken earlier, early in the year, uh, we don't uh, advise any kind of harvesting at that time of the year. Basically, a rule of thumb from November till about the end, maybe the first or second week in February, and that's about it. Um, I don't hunt them early, and I don't hunt them late when they pair up. Uh, to mate, um, I quit hunting them at that point in time because their their pelts uh, basically aren't worth nearly as much, and uh, uh, I just don't think it's the right thing to do. I don't consider myself a coyote hunter um, as much as I do a uh, a coyote harvester, if you would. But anyway, we'll set this over here. There's just one other thing we need to cover, or we probably ought to cover. This coyote, by the way, should be put back on the fan for a couple more days before he's taken off the stretcher. Um, here's a few coyotes that uh, are going to be sold here. It's five out of a batch of 80 uh, that I have. And uh, as you can right here, there's probably $200 worth of fur right here. They were put up in this exactly the same manner as that coyote was, skinned exactly the same. Um, very beautiful coyotes, very beautiful. Excellent put up on these coyotes. You'll get the most you can get out of these pelts if you put them up in the manner that we just went through. Um, about the only thing that, that we might want to go over now real quick would be, uh, I think it's important, would be to talk about the, uh, the cartridges that we use Let me get that turned off uh, the cartridges we use to take these animals uh, I figured out uh, the other day that uh, my partner and I have harvested over 1500 coyotes and through all that uh, we've decided uh, you know a long time ago that the 17 caliber was the caliber of choice uh, either the 17 or something smaller. Uh, whenever you get into the, the 224 diameters, uh, the percentage of pelt damage is, is vastly, uh, well, the potential is, is vastly greater. And you're not going to be able to produce a consistent pelt uh, like these pelts uh, if you're using a, a rifle that's, uh, that's just too much gun. These are thin-skinned animals. Even though they're very, they're, they're tough animals, they're hard to kill. Um, the 17 caliber is my caliber, caliber of choice. 
and uh, I shoot 25 and 30 grain bullet weights as fast as I can drive them. And I try to hit the coyotes either at the base of the neck in this area here or a broadside shot just behind the shoulder in this area here. I try not to hit them high because as you can see from that coyote we did have some damage. We were able to hide the damage on that coyote but not all the time are you going to be able to do that and the fur buyers um, they're pretty good at picking out damage and they'll take a, a forty dollar coyote uh, or a thirty dollar coyote and turn it into a five ten dollar coyote uh, just like that and uh, all because you shot the thing with a with a 250 um, and a 50 grain blitz or something of that nature and you hit it in the shoulder or you hit it high or you hit it too far back I don't expect people to give up on their 250s and, and things like that but all I'm saying is if you're gonna if you're gonna be serious about putting up coyotes uh, hunting them to put them up commercially then you're gonna you're gonna want to be efficient at it and you're gonna want to use uh, a rifle and cartridge that's uh, enough to do the job but not too much and uh, Anyway, I guess that's about it. Uh, I would like to add that, uh, as obviously, um, we didn't want to go to a lot of expense producing this skin and video. Uh, we wanted to be able to produce something that uh, was uh, in depth, but not expensive to produce. Something that uh, young young people could buy, um, could afford to buy, and get into this, and get them started the right way and I think we've accomplished that um, along with the, the video uh, I'm gonna give uh, anybody out there interested uh, my home phone number um, if they have any questions about the video uh, or calibers uh, any questions at all regarding you know commercial predator hunting uh, again my name's Blaine Eddy and our phone number out here is 801 8258981 and you can call us anytime and I'll try to get back with you as quick as I can and I think that about covers it um, good luck and thanks for thanks for buying the video if you follow everything that's on this tape I guarantee you you're gonna produce a very fine pelt and uh, the fur buyers will comment to you how nice a job that you did uh, every year that uh, that you're able to get out and hunt these. So anyway, thanks again, and uh, I'll either uh, see you on the next video, or maybe we'll catch you sometime on the internet. Thanks again. Folks, this is Mr. Ed Valcarsi out of Brigham City, Utah. He's come out here today, kind enough to give us a bid on all this fur. This is, uh, what, 2003, 2004's take. He's going to go down through these pelts, and hopefully we can have him point out a few things on what he's looking for and what he's not looking for. Uh, put up is very, very important. Now, these first two racks that I've looked at here, Possibly this third rack here. They're all nice coyotes. They carry lots of fur on them. 
As you can tell, they got nice, big, heavy, pale backs. They're all, this is a big coyote. They're big coyotes, too. A lot of white, lots of fur, lots of hair on them, lots of fur on them. He's got these first three racks here, just about like peas in a pod. There's not much difference as far as the amount of fur and the color of them. Ed, how important Here's the back, here's a coyote right here that's a little shallow in the back. It's what we call a shallow back. It hasn't finished off or else it's rubbed the hair out of it. A coyote like that would be downgraded. Of course, it's not a very big coyote either. May have had some kind of a disease or may have been shot just the hair early or something. It's not carrying much hair on the belly. Ed, how important is damage to the pelt? When, when you're grading these and you come across one that's obviously uh, been damaged, was unable to be prepared, bullet damage I'm talking about. Well, how critical is that when you grade these? Critical on, on fur because they have a certain standard of, of, of grading fur, whether it's a red fox. If you take a red fox, for instance, if it's got a... Uh, uh, on red foxes, to give you an idea, on red foxes we look basically... After we look at the red fox, we look basically at the rump because usually where they'll start to rub is on the rump. If they're rubbing on the rump, they're thrown out as a number three. Anything that's damaged like that, bullet holes damaged, they ain't sewed up proper to where you can't see them, it makes the animal worth half price. Whether you Ooh. sell them to me or go straight to a manufacturer, he'll discount them 50%. If they're damaged really bad and they grade them as a number four, or like a fox, if it's rubbed really bad, they're graded as a number four, then you'll drop down to 25% of the value of the pelt. So uh, the time of the year you take them and the damage on them is very, very important. Because what they're buying is a coyote, and they want the whole coyote. It's just that simple. These are all put up exceptionally well. Excellent. Excellent. Here's one that's a little bit sharp, a little bit, not too bad, but he's still a little sharp. You can tell, see? Nothing but the guard hair. No cushion, no fur underneath. There's a nice coyote, fully covered. There's some down the line here that's better. Here's another one, it's just a hair shallow on the back, see? at the time of the year, the section they were taken, or the breed of the animal. I knew just as soon as I saw that, that he'll have a, a fair belly. I'm not knocking these coyotes, I'm just trying to show you the difference yeah, we don't want you to, in the quality, we don't want you to, see? Anytime you can run honest, your hand up a coyote like that, and he looks like a porcupine, see, he looks like a porcupine, you turn him over and he won't have a very good belly, now watch. See that? See, I got a very good belly on him, see? See, more hair. The fur, fur. You don't call it hair, you call it fur. This coyote, I'll bet you a dollar, this coyote here will have a gorgeous belly because look how full he is. See how full he is? All of that hair, all of that under fur. See, he's full. Now you watch when I turn him. Look at that. Beautiful white belly on him. They have a good back, they have a good belly. They have a good belly, they'll have a good back. Now this coyote here is a nice coyote, but he isn't the coyote this one is. And you can wow. just see it by looking at it. You can see the cushion this coyote got. This is a nice coyote, don't get me wrong. He's just a shade, not quite as good as that one, but it's a nice coyote. I bet you got a good belly on him too. See? Completely full, nice white. Hold that coyote up there. Can you see the difference in them two bellies? Yeah, especially right up through this area here. He's wider. really heavy. He's wider. And he's lighter. Yeah, he's quite a bit, actually. Yeah, he's wider. Yeah. I told you to look at that. <laughs> You've been in the business how long, Ed? 60? 56 almost years 56 I've graded years. these things. I used to buy these coyotes from a guy down in Sholo, Arizona. 40, 50 years ago. Used to send me, I used to give him five dollars a piece for him. He used to skin them, but he was like Blaine here. He would never shoot or trap an animal that he didn't pelt and put on a stretcher. But that was in the days when you could buy gas for 
18 cents a gallon, so five bucks. He'd always send me about 20 or 30 a year. Every year, that clockwork. Here's another coyote. Pretty nice coyote. It's fair. A little bit small. A nice white belly. All in all, this is an excellent bunch of coyotes. Got good size and good color. Only three or four in the whole bunch. It's now there's one that's got some obvious damage right here and it's not tail. Now what if this coyote was white? And if this coyote, if this coyote would have been pale and not had this damage, that spot right there, he would have been, and what you're saying is he would have been worth about 50% more. Here's a typical western coyote. See, he's, uh, he's dark on the belly. That's the first thing that degrades a a Northwestern or a Montana, the first thing that grade him out is the belly. Because they want white. They're screaming for white. Just like a just like a, uh, a lynx cat or bobcat. They want that white in the spots. On a big big white belly with lots of spots on it. This coyote is just dark, see. Maybe classified as a extra large western. If you was grading them down to Size. This is an exceptionally good red fox. Nice and full, no rubbing down here. Usually when they grade a red, they'll be they'll look for rub spots. You know that's where they'll come out is out here. And as the season goes, like now, if you shot a, if you trapped a red fox, he would probably be rubbing up in here, all over. In fact, I saw one the other day that a trapper had caught when he went out to pull his traps. Yeah, Ed, I want to thank you for taking the time and coming up here. I know you're going to still got to work up your figures and stuff on you. Uh, well, you're welcome. Anytime I can help you. Yeah, there's a lot of them out here to go hang back up. Yeah, I'm not going to help you. <laughs>